Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, and, and for those that I haven't met before, I'm Professor Sheehan. I teach uh, Econ 51, which is uh, infrastructure policy in developing countries during winter study. And I'm delighted to be up here this morning with our distinguished guest, Dr. Ahmed Kaikos, who has been in, in your shoes, as you already have heard. In fact, uh, when he was here in uh, 1999, when uh, Dr. Kaikos arrived here, he came from a country with uh, a GDP of under $500 per capita, one of the poorest countries in the world. And after his experience at CDE, uh, as you've heard, he went back to Bangladesh, came back for a PhD for a while, and then served in a wide uh, variety of uh, positions in the government of uh, Bangladesh, rising to uh, eventually secretary and senior secretary of the power division, which means he was essentially in charge of electricity policy in Bangladesh, and then becoming chief advisor to the prime minister, which is about as senior a position as you're going to get in the Bangladeshi civil service. And uh, now he is back again here in the United States uh, as Bangladesh's representative on the World Bank board. And as he comes back here, now Bangladesh, the country he's, uh, he's temporarily left behind again, has a per capita GDP of two, just under $2,500 per year. So five times the size of the per capita GDP that it was when Dr. Kaikas was a part of the CDE cohort. Now this has been one of the most impressive uh, economic uh, um, uh, progressions amongst developing countries during that period. And yesterday, Dr. Kaikas shared some of his views about what had made this impressive uh, economic growth in Bangladesh possible and how contributions from a CDE alumni as doctor, such as Dr. Kaikas had been able to, uh, to support that, uh, that progress. And he shared some views about things that he didn't think were central to, uh, to the progress. Some of the larger theories as he talked about, whether it's size of the uh, economy itself or the amount of borrowing uh, uh, or even uh, uh, public spending. But rather, he talked about the importance of, of keeping in mind specificities of context, uh, the developments of multifaceted uh, process with lots of aspects to uh, uh, keep an eye on and the importance of, of leadership. I think when you're sitting here in the uh, cohort at CDE and you're going through classes and contemplating going back to your countries and thinking about, well, you know, how do we get, go home and uh, contribute to this same kind of impressive economic growth as uh, Bangladesh has witnessed since uh, Dr. Kaikas was here. Uh, sometimes it seems a little overwhelming how you're going to translate what you learn here uh, into specific policy when you go back. And this is why I think it's really invaluable to have the insights of an alumni who's had a distinguished career as Dr. Kaikas has had there uh, to actually come back here and complement some of what you're getting otherwise in the classes with some of this real world experience. Uh, so I'm very excited that, uh, to be participating here in this, uh, in this weekend where you get that opportunity. And we want to thank the Per Jacobson Foundation, whose financial support has made this possible. And, and particularly, I also want to call out and, and congratulate Tom Powers, who had the vision to think of this initiative uh, and uh, put in the work to make it possible. So I think as, uh, without further ado, we'll get into uh, trying to uh, coax out some more insights from Dr. Kaikos for you about uh, how things worked for him when he left CDE and went back into, uh, into policy making. So what we'll do is we'll, uh, I will uh, ask uh, initially Dr. Kaikos some questions, firstly about his, uh, uh, some aspects of his CDE experience and, and how he's applied that. We'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, uh, policies in Bangladesh. Um, 
and then we will open it up for questions. And I, we're delighted yesterday to see uh, how active the uh, cohort was in terms of uh, questions that they, uh, that they had, and we'll look forward to more of the same, more of the same today. So uh, with that, um, Dr. Kaikas, maybe you'd uh, start us off today with um, some thoughts of you know, what, what have been the highlights of your post-CDE career from your perspective? Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, I think I need to make something clear uh, because uh, you um, are kind enough to highlight my career, but uh, that has also given some probably wrong impression that after my attendance in CDE, Bangladesh has changed. <laughs> so it may sound like that I am the person who has changed the country. Uh, actually not, but I mean, I mean for the CDE fellows you have to, uh, since uh, you are here, um, the one thing I need to uh, make you very much uh, uh, clear as a you know, uh, former civil servant is that you know, we work like shadow. So, um, and um, you know, the shadow becomes uh, larger when the leadership and has a more vision. So, uh, usually uh, the credit goes to the uh, politicians uh, who are committed more enough to change <coughs> the country. So, in Bangladesh's case, uh, we have been fortunate that you know there are some huge policy shifts during my career. Uh, so having said that, what is the impact that I had uh, in my career after I um, came to CDE? <clears throat> Let me put it in a very simple way, is that uh, I came from a country which is very crowded and obviously we were facing a lot of infrastructure and every uh, sort of uh, deficiencies. So when I first, um, first day I landed in the US is, was uh, Denver Airport. Such a beautiful, you know, airport. And then, interestingly, um, the first person I saw was a young lady. And she was so beautiful, uh, like a, you know, film star. So, you know, this is kind of, uh, I'm just, you know, telling you how, what kind of feelings you get landing in a developed country. And then, you know, I spent two months in Boulder, uh, Colorado. And Boulder, Colorado is quite, you know, shiny city. And then when I came to CD, it's a rural small town. So um, that was a bit uh, heartening for me in a sense that I grew up in a city, although it was very uh, not so nice as US cities. And then went back to another interesting city. I was very much uh, energized, so then here I came. So I thought, wow, is it a uh, place to live? <laughs> then, you know, um, I got into the studies. And also the beauty of human relationship. You see here, uh, when you drive, you don't see people much. You don't see the vibe. But when you start to leave, then you feel the, you know, the uh, touch of life. So these are the like outside experiences other than the, uh, you know, uh, classes that we attended. So the classes like this same way started to put some, you know, de you know uh, influences in my mind, in my uh, ability to see things. And then, you know, when you leave and the, uh, you know, courses that I took uh, was also like, you know, very much interesting and had a very, uh, I think, significant in impact in my uh, intellectual ability 
in a sense that when we studied, we thought the curriculum and uh, you know, education in the US is far different. Otherwise, how come this country has grown so much? Then when we started to study our economics, like you know, econometrics, macro, and other uh, you know, international trade, and I found the same course. The difference is that, you know, uh, the uh, teacher was a white guy and uh, speaking in English. However, that is actually one sort of like, you know, comforting situation, uh, you know, uh, I think a comforting uh, impact that, well, I'm not that far behind. Intellectually, I'm not that far behind. So this is one, uh, I think, uh, very significant impact for the students, those who are here, they will realize that they have already, you know, uh, knowledge of the basics of economics. Then when you compare with the, uh, and then you find that the teachers or the uh, faculty members are doing it in a better way. They are relating it to, the, uh, to your real life. Uh, sometimes it is not possible in developing countries, especially if I uh, say from Bangladesh's perspective, we had so many students. The teachers did not have ability to reach to every student. So naturally, this was uh, uh, not possible here since the class size is small and then you can have uh, interaction. And also the other, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think, um, um, aspect for what I have seen here is that you can reach out to the faculty member very easily. And I have used this tool uh, or opportunity quite often I reached out to them and had a conversation. So these conversations actually education, you know, <clears throat> is almost widespread everywhere. It depends how you actually um, provide education and how you take it, and then how you put yourself into that situation that whether I am, I am capable to do it or not. So I think, uh, you know, I never expected that Williams, you know, um, 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 degree is going to change my life. But, and I, I think th nobody should do it, but we should try to see what differences did it make. Mm -hmm. And I found it is very, very, uh, you know, uh, useful. Let me give you an example how actually, I, uh, I was telling this to a student yesterday, how it impacted my, uh, you know, ability to work in the ministry. So usually when we go back to Bangladesh or uh, country, then we expect that I am going to be posted in finance or uh, external resource division uh, and, you know, uh, policy related issues. But I was posted in telecommunication. And um, at that time there was a massive, you know, privatization going on. And fortunately I was put into that uh, um, section. And believe me, I could see the difference and the, you know, uh, future impact or ability to analyze. And, you know, in just three months, I became favorite to everyone, including my, you know, um, clients, mm -hmm. which is the private sector and my bosses. Because, you know, I think that was because of the, uh, you know, uh, courses that I took here. So, in a nutshell, I think uh, I gave you a very long answer, uh, you know, answer for a very short question probably, but I thought it is uh, required in a sense that everybody should understand that the education does not give you a result mm -hmm. the next day. Mm -hmm. Education has a long-term impact. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, uh, <clears throat> Here in uh, CDE, we had host country, uh, host family program. And I had like, 
you know, one uh, U.S. Uh, parents here. Mm -hmm. And also I saw the people, those who are like, you know, um, honking is very natural in my country. And, uh, and if you see that, you know, someone is crossing the road, the driver is, you know, uh, increases his speed and also honks, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But here, children are walking and the driver is stopping, is stop the car and doesn't make any sound. Like even if it takes five minutes. So this is, uh, I, because you see, good behavior is, does not come from automatically, it's experience. So this is the experience that gives, especially people from developing country, in a, although it's a very rural sitting, what gives the value of humanity, value or, uh, you know, the power of good behavior, mm -hmm. power of empathy. Mm -hmm. I think CDE not only taught, you know, development economics to me, of, uh, but, you know, gave a huge experience about life. And that is why I believe that this is a huge, and also thanks to my professor, uh, two professors in fact, mm -hmm. who encouraged me to go for PhD. That is why someone was asking me at what age you have gone for PhD. I gone for PhD at 41 years, mm -hmm. which is quite unlucky, uh, uh, unlikely. And many of my uh, friends in my PhD program was asking me, what the hell you are going to do? <laughs> The, with this degree at this age. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I believe that has gave, given me enough, uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. ability mm -hmm. to communicate, to analyze, and mm -hmm. to see things differently. Well, coming, coming back to your, your phraseology of uh, what the hell are you going to do? Um, <laughs> so, so, now, uh, Dr. Kaiser, when, when, you, when you left CDE, mm -hmm. um, did you envisage a future career unfolding the way yours did? Or did you envisage somehow something co completely different than the way it wound up? Well, <clears throat> um, usually civil service is uh, something that is called CADA service because you can see your future. But uh, in developing countries, actually this is not, uh, especially like in Bangladesh because uh, you know, it was an emerging um, situation. So uh, we had a lot of uncertainty there. Mm -hmm. And coming back to whether, you know, this was going to be my end, no, mm -hmm. not at all. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I had actually, that, uh, you know, faced a lot of trouble, in fact, uh, from my um, course mates, my civil service uh, peers, um, because, you see, the world is full of competition. So when my friends uh, see that this person has gained some ability, so that means, you know, I have more potential to, uh, you know, uh, progress. To, pro to progress mm -hmm. over them. So they will try to actually hold you back. And uh, in my career, you see, um, I was not considered for promotion, mm -hmm. which is supposed to be in due course, in three times in my, you know, uh, in Bangladesh, the position ladder is uh, assistant secretary, deputy secretary, joint secretary, additional secretary, and secretary. So I was not promoted, I was superseded in joint secretary, in additional secretary, hmm. or even in secretary. Hmm. So everybody thought that I am a lost case. Hmm. But I had a feeling that, you know, if you work, uh, actually at, at some point I wanted to leave the civil service because hmm. uh, I'm not getting the uh, so-called uh, the um, uh, mm -hmm. expected results. <clears throat> but um, I have to give credit to my mm -hmm. wife. Uh, she basically insisted me that, you know, um, I have been with you uh, 
all through these years and we never wanted uh, mm -hmm. luxury but <clears throat> your mother has uh, you know uh, forced you to the civil service and i know that you have the ability so go go at you know i i Persevere. I, 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 I joined mm -hmm. uh, International Food Policy mm -hmm. Research Institute and I got a promotion there uh, mm -hmm. before actually uh, I was supposed to get it in three years but I got it in two years so um, it seemed like I might have a good career there uh, but I mean she forced me to come back to the civil service mm -hmm. and told me that you know uh, try for some time if you don't the don't get the recognition then you have the option to leave and um, actually now the credit has to go to my wife uh, mm -hmm. that she's the person who changed my career uh, but i think you know uh, any career is mm -hmm. bumpy but at the end of the day if you work sincerely mm -hmm. you will get your reward mm -hmm. that is in my case has happened Great, uh, great ad advice for everyone, everyone here. Now, I was going to ask you what the uh, highlight of your time at CDE was, but we've already just found out that it's uh, learning that you have to stop for children in the site in the crosswalk <laughs> and you can't ho honk at them. <laughs> uh, but uh, may maybe tell us if you had to pick three things that uh, at your time in CDE uh, that uh, you think. Uh, have turned out to be the most valuable for you. What, what three things might you pick? Well, um, I think one I have already uh, uh, described mm -hmm. is I have learned, you know, um, how to show respect and uh, mm -hmm. empathy and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, show tolerance uh, because that is the, probably the beauty of the city. Mm -hmm. That is one. Uh, and then um, I have learned actually um, from the uh, CD faculty that how to engage with the uh, you know students. Uh, I think this is very much uh, important. Um, you know, um, as I said, in uh, our country the uh, class sizes are so large. Uh, then uh, I don't think that you know uh, even if our professors wanted to. Uh, you know, have relationship uh, or, you know, connect with the individual uh, students, uh, but they could not. But here, in fact, um, I saw that this, uh, you, know, this was, you know, sort of like dedication towards the um, <clears throat> um, uh, students. But the most important thing that uh, I got from CD is that I could compare uh, myself with the developed country perspective. Mm -hmm. So I could see whether I am an, you know, outlier or, you know, outdated or less skilled or I have the ability to work like, uh, you know, the, uh, with the same standard that my friends in, uh, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. So um, that is probably the most boosting and uh, it, I think uh, experience mm -hmm. for everyone um, uh, who uh, actually came here before and the people, those are the students, those who are kind of coming in future would be most important that put myself or yourself uh, into this position whether mm -hmm. I have the ability mm -hmm. or capacity or intellectual capacity uh, to work because we tended to believe that the productivity is higher in a developed country like the U.S. is the most developed country and you know they have more intellectual ability and uh, so you know I found that no they are also human beings like me and they have a brain which is quite similar to me and the skills are also not vastly different. So I think uh, that is the confidence that I took from CD. Those are great and useful observations, I think, for everybody, uh, everybody here. Now, I, I said three there, and you, you very uh, 
uh, successfully turn those into really pieces of advice for members of the cohort here. Um, if I didn't hold you to three, are there uh, additional pieces of advice at this point that you would, uh, that you have in your mind that you'd want to, uh, to, to pass along? Well, I think I should hold it back because uh, at some point I might try to work as a consultant, so uh, ah. then I can, I can sell this, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> We've lost our chance, Tom. There we go. Uh, in fact, actually, uh, as I uh, started in the beginning that, you know, um, I think I have mentioned this before yesterday as well, mm -hmm. you know, uh, when act, uh, There is a huge, you see, I think, tension between uh, politicians and bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Politicians, you know, uh, we have to understand that is what I think is, uh, uh, you know, this is not actually related to CD, but mm -hmm. I think uh, I would like to give this advice as mm -hmm. a, a former civil servant. Mm -hmm. We have to understand that you know, we got our chance to come to CD. The country is sending us, or anyhow, uh, we get this opportunity from uh, our uh, uh, donor agencies. But the politicians, they don't get this, you know, uh, training. But they have a common, you know, intention to do better. That is why they are here they do the politics and others. I'm not saying that, you know, they are all uh, best person on earth and uh, we have a, uh, but I don't think that, you know, in a democracy there is any alternative. So what we should do? The thing is that we should understand and try to make a better, you know, uh, relationship so that we can work together. I think, uh, you know, one of my uh, best, um, uh, I think, achievements, I would rather say, mm -hmm. is that I never had any, uh, obviously I had trouble, but I never had any major, I never faced any major obstructions from the politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, be it, I mean, I have worked with notorious people, uh, but I have, I have, uh, been able to manage it and uh, I have been, uh, I think, quite successful to convince. Mm -hmm. So I think that is one uh, advice because uh, mm -hmm. the people or those who come to CDE are actually uh, uh, working the system and um, that made us quite uh, nervous when we were young, but um, I in my opinion, that can be actually achieved very easily. Mm -hmm. Once you set your principle, then adaptation. I'm not say asking you to uh, give up your principle or ethical standard, but if you stay in your course, you shall be able to do it. Thank you, Dr. Cox. I think that managing that uh, interrelation between the bureaucracy and the administrative side of the government and the policy maker and the, and the politicians is so critical to actu the actual implementation of, of successful policy. So that's a great, uh, that's a great uh, piece here. I, I'm glad that you uh, framed that you had worked with notorious people, not in the context of your time at CDE. So that, that, was, uh, that was good. I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. delighted you put it in a different context. But maybe we use that as a segue to talk a little bit more about policy itself uh, and some of the policies you've been involved in uh, helping to uh, design and implement in Bangladesh. And in particular, the power sector where you have uh, uh, been um, especially involved. Um, do you see that the, the policies that you were involved in in your time in Bangladesh in the electricity sector uh, do you feel that those have been um, particularly successful or, or less so, and, 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 and why? Well, uh, I, I mean, I'm trying to be decent, but I uh, sound like maybe arrogant. Uh, I 
we claim that that was quite successful. Uh, I think um, in numbers as well as in the growth, uh, that was successful. How was it successful? Again, uh, you know, um, I have to give this uh, <clears throat> credit to the leadership because <clears throat> we were facing huge power, power crisis. And interestingly, Bangladesh was growing very fast. And um, <clears throat> our infrastructure was lagging behind. Uh, and uh, public discontent was, you know, uh, was uh, reaching to sky high. So the first and foremost, uh, the uh, elected uh, government's role was how to improve this. And as you know, in any, uh, this is uh, investment project, mm -hmm. procurement. So usually we have a st gold standard uh, in every um, country and especially like even uh, the development partners that they want a you know, tendering process to get best out of it. Then the prime ministers uh, sat with, actually at that time I was not there, uh, my, uh, my uh, predecessors were there. Mm -hmm. So I asked them, how can you do it, you know, the fastest way? So uh, usually any tendering process takes around two years. So she asked how to, you know, change this. So um, then a simple strategy that we follow as an individual was proposed. What is that? Let me explain. Let me ask you or uh, anyone, uh, if you allow, then mm -hmm. I can ask. Mm -hmm. So if you want to buy a car or build a house for you, what would you do? Say uh, you wanted to buy a car to, uh, next week. You know, when you float a tender, there is a competition, right? So the, you might get the lowest price. Mm -hmm. Do you do that? Come on, have some answer. <laughs> no. Huh? no, we go to a, a shop to buy a car. Right, so you get the information and then buy it. Everybody is doing it. I don't think anywhere in the world they are, our, if, you know, if you decide to build a house or buy a house, even when you are buying a million dollar house, you don't float a tender. You ask your friends, you compare information and then directly reach out to the seller. Mm -hmm. This is exactly the policy change in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. This idea was that we will get information and reach out to them and ask them to come and build something. Mm -hmm. bu come and build something. Mm -hmm. For that, we made a negotiation committee, mm -hmm. and the negotiation committee is uh, included from uh, all important, you know, ministries. Mm -hmm. And this will be going to be an open negotiation. Mm -hmm. So when you are increasing the number of uh, members in the negotiation committee, so it is difficult for the firm to reach out to one person, right? Mm -hmm. So that is how we try to, you know, uh, put checks and balances there. And it worked. Hmm. And every time, every project that we took was, the tariff was lower than the um, tender price. Mm -hmm. Because in the tender price, there are some you know, problems is that anticipating mm -hmm. <coughs> something, you mm -hmm. always put this into cost. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, in my opinion, I don't know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. there could be a lot of uh, arguments about that. So this is a huge policy change. Mm -hmm. Since unsolicited offer is being entertained, mm -hmm. the civil servants were very nervous. Mm -hmm. Then the prime minister says that, okay, I am uh, willing to take the risk, but my first priority 
is uh, you know 100 percent electrification. Then she told that okay make a law that whatever you are going to do uh, is going to be to have immunity. And then we became like you know free and well I was part of it I cannot uh, uh, justify myself wholly, but my predecessors or even my successors, not for a single case there was an issue raised about corruption. We were empowered because I was the, I was leading the negotiation committee, so I had the sole power, but unfortunately nobody reached out to me that okay, do this favor, I will give you money mm -hmm. or neither mm -hmm. we have had any allegation about it. Mm -hmm. So actually we have followed a very basic simple of individual human behavior, mm -hmm. number one. Number two is that we found a huge, you know, uh, interest mm -hmm. from international, you know, uh, organizations. Uh, I mean uh, not funding in this case because mm -hmm. that is a violation of the principle of uh, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, you know lending agencies and also other <coughs> uh, international companies those who are investing in power. So that is how we have been able to you know the um, uh, power generation when this government took power the power generation capacity was 4,500 megawatt, mm -hmm. but now it is over 26,000 megawatt. And when we opened this up for the private sector, three companies from Sri Lanka, you know, uh, uh, came to invest in Bangladesh. At that time, Sri Lanka's investment, uh, I mean, sorry, um, uh, power generation capacity was 3,500. Sri Lanka is still have these 3,500, but in Bangladesh now it is 2,600, uh, 26,000 megawatt capacity. Mm -hmm. So I think we have been able to create an atmosphere of investment mm -hmm. through the private sector. Now more than 50 percent of our power generation come from mm -hmm. private sector, mm -hmm. which is highly capital intensive and which is also highly technical. Mm -hmm. So that's I believe is a you know um, new opening in a sense that this has opened up the uh, you know um, opportunities, mm -hmm. atmosphere, confidence for the rest of the world mm -hmm. that if you go to Bangladesh then you can actually um, have a secure investment from where you can also expect you know a better return uh, for future. And that is why we never had any problem of investment mm -hmm. or financing. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, you know um, in my opinion Bangladesh's power sector actually um, has been a very successful story mm -hmm. uh, and um, in fact uh, in our power sector, our growth is much higher than our all neighboring countries, mm -hmm. including India. So I think, uh, you know, um, I feel quite fortunate that the Prime Minister has chosen me to work there mm -hmm. and uh, had this confidence on me, but I have enjoyed uh, enormously. Well, it's, it's difficult in, a, in, in uh, five to ten minutes to succinctly pull out a few elements of policy of something as complicated as that. So thank you very much. That was, that was uh, excellent. And uh, as a quick commercial for those who want to spend an entire term talking about this kind of thing, <laughs> sign up for Econ 51 and we'll <laughs> talk about including a case study on electricity in, in Bangladesh. But let's uh, maybe uh, staying with the sector, but um, maybe uh, branching out to some of the countries that uh, the current cohort cohort members are from, uh, the situation in Bangladesh in the last year in the power sector has been quite difficult. We've had rising global uh, uh, 
energy prices, uh, we had depreciation of the currency, um, uh, depletion of uh, foreign exchange reserves, among other issues. And that has, con those factors have contributed to uh, a significant shortfall in generation. Uh, in the course of this last year and some you know, power cuts that hadn't been seen in, in a number of years. Now that situation also is being faced by a number of other uh, developing countries. Uh, today these circumstances are not unique to Bangladesh. But from your perspective of having been um, uh, overseeing the, the, the sector uh, for several years uh, in Bangladesh, what kind of things can um, developing countries generally think about in terms of policy uh, to help create a somewhat more robust um, uh, sector situation uh, where they might be able to navigate through these kind of difficulties that Bangladesh and a number of other countries are seeing in their electricity sector now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, the extent of power cut uh, that has happened uh, in Bangladesh I think, uh, you know, they could have avoided at least 50 percent of it, mm -hmm. in my opinion, because uh, there was lack of coordination uh, of the government spending and uh, prioritizing. So, um, uh, you see, Reserve Bank is for pol monetary policy and the fiscal decision is the government, mm -hmm. right? So, um, the <clears throat> Bangladesh Bank, I mean, uh, has actually uh, been deciding mm -hmm. what to do. Mm -hmm. So, that is kind of like overlapping uh, mm -hmm. the situation. That is, uh, you know, individual. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, you see, um, there is a big difference between uh, being an economist and non-economist, in fact. While I was power secretary, mm -hmm. I have mentioned this several times to our, uh, you know, this is an open forum, I don't know, I mean our finance minister, uh, mm -hmm. he's dead though now. I told him that there is probably a divergence because the uh, power capacity that we were creating mm -hmm. were 100 percent import dependent, the fuel. Mm -hmm. So usually uh, there is a ratio which is called like at least 65 percent of your production cost is fuel cost. Mm -hmm. So um, in thermal, <clears throat> yeah. Huh? Mm -hmm. So in thermal. Mm -hmm. So usually um, you know. So this is the rule for mm -hmm. everywhere, not uh, mm -hmm. you know renewable, but mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. or the, the where the fuel is uh, concerned. So that means when you are growing, mm -hmm. you are importing fuel with dollars and you are producing electricity which is in, in local taka. currency. Yeah. So unless you have export basket diver, you know, uh, increased, it will be difficult to match. Uh, and um, our then foreign minister, or, uh, sorry, foreign minister did not pay any attention to this. Uh, I told him several times that, you know, we need to make this uh, uh, arrangements for future, otherwise it's going mm -hmm. to be a problem. So that is exactly what we saw mm -hmm. uh, recently. And when the, there is a price highs, this is even more difficult. Mm -hmm. What we can do? You see, I think, you know, um, <clears throat> other than we, um, we should come out with a policy. Number one is that, uh, export diversification is a must. So whenever you increase your import uh, on something, you should, you cannot at same proportion do it, but you should have some policies that will replace, you know, this uh, risk in future. <clears throat> then um, I think, I mean, uh, what I have been trying for a very long time, uh, since I was additional secretary in the power division is to increase the regional connectivity in renewables. Mm -hmm. You see, um, 
Bhutan mm -hmm. has a capacity of 35,000 megawatt, proven capacity mm -hmm. of hydroelectricity. Um, Nepal, actually there is a uh, uh, difference, uh, but I can tell you for, with confidence that at least 25,000 megawatt. <clears throat> and in Myanmar, it is even bigger. And uh, according to their uh, report, it is 100,000 megawatt. Can you believe, you know, with all these, these countries, if they produce hydroelectricity, half of it, they will never use this amount of electricity. Because their population is less and, uh, you know, um, uh, I think uh, their demand is less. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Demand is going mm -hmm. to be less all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. So who is the candidate for it? Bangladesh mm -hmm. and India, mm -hmm. right? So India, you know, taking other than from their northeastern region mm -hmm. is quite long. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, their uh, uh, system loss would be higher. So Bangladesh is the best candidate for this hydroelectricity. Mm -hmm. And this is a win-win situation. And we can actually make a region of renewable energy. Mm -hmm. Everybody talks <coughs> nowadays about hydroelect uh, you know, um, climate change. Mm -hmm. Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Myanmar could create a world of hydro, uh, you know, uh, zero carbon, mm -hmm. uh, at least in energy, very easily. So, uh, in my opinion, if you want a long term, you know, um, mm -hmm. because in hydroelectricity, I think we can also um, minimize the, uh, you know, uh, bounces of fuel, you know, fuel, fuel cost. Mm -hmm. yep. So, you are going to be immune for any shocks in the future. So, that is the probably, in my opinion, is the, you know, ultimate mm -hmm. solution mm -hmm. if we want to do. Uh, you know, um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, immune Bangladesh mm -hmm. from any shocks. Or mm -hmm. these countries can also mm -hmm. make money very easily, uh, mm -hmm. which can be utilized for other, you know, infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, building. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, we have, uh, I think, entered into a um, 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 project with ne uh, Nepal, mm -hmm. with GMR, but still we have not uh, received the clearance of, uh, well, um, Transmission line. Oh, the transmission. However, <coughs> I mean, <coughs> to be um, short, I think this is the um, ultimate solution. Other than that, I don't see any um, you know, alternative. I don't have any um, mm -hmm. um, alternative in my uh, mind that right. can resolve right. this issue. Right. Well, very, very useful insights. And as you said, context matters. So maybe slightly different in 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 other countries, but the great. Uh, great insights that can be useful in lots of places. Now, I have a number of more questions, but I think what would make sense at this point to do is uh, open it up to uh, first to our uh, CDE uh, uh, colleagues here uh, for uh, questions. We'll, we'll see if there are as many hands as, uh, as we uh, saw yesterday. Um, and we also have uh, potentially some questions uh, online that uh, we'll look at. So. Let's, uh, if you're all right, we'll turn it over to the sure. floor and see what, uh, see what questions there are. Maybe we'll take a couple of questions at a time so that you can sure. organize this as you want there. So um, who would like to start off the process? Yes, please. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, I think you yeah, can sure. speak yeah. Maybe just introduce yourself first. Okay. And then, yeah. uh, my name is Sarah yesterday. Uh, I ask a question. <laughs> that really, I'm um, very happy uh, to be at this conference. And uh, thank you very much to, for this huge experience you are sharing with us. And uh, thank you also to depend in the, this big uh, network of uh, city, city around the world. So, for sure, uh, this master, we are taking the certainly deepen our expertise in policy, public policy, public policy, public policy sorry, mm -hmm. 
And uh, we all know that uh, Paris policy, policy is correlated with the international environment. I would like to know yourself um, how, uh, what the, how uh, uh, fellows, uh, the city's fellows should be facing to the emerging of the new uh, order, uh, new world order, the BRICS uh, emerging, mm -hmm. how fit the, the city of Europe should be, mm -hmm. and for yourself, with your experience, mm -hmm. how, what is your perception of this emerging world, and what is the position of um, Bangladesh? Okay. Oh, maybe wow. maybe, maybe to paraphrase a little bit, so uh, I think if I, Serge, if I, if I caught the, the, the question, question correctly, so with the emergence of the BRICS countries, which I, hopefully everybody here, you know, Brazil, Russia, mm -hmm. uh, India, uh, China, and uh, South, South Africa. Africa. Thank you, I, I was gonna trip on the yes there. Okay, um, how does that affect uh, uh, policy making uh, in, in these countries and, and really what's, what's your view on the emergence of the BRICS generally? So. Oh. Should, should, well, we, should, should we take one, one, one more question and yeah, then sure, can, sure. gives you a, a minute to think also about uh, how you'd want to approach that. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Tobo Kiri I'm from Malawi. And I'd like to first say thank you for coming here to speak with us and share your perspective and experiences. It's been very both enlightening and very encouraging. Um, I wanted to ask, in your experience working in the public service, um, what are what have you done to deal with instances of brain drain, brain drain within within the public service? Because it's it's not just civil service developing all of these skills and then deciding to leave the public service, but also deciding to leave the country. And the real integral part of development is giving giving all of these people a reason to stay with us, to stay in the government, and work with us. So, how did you deal with? A terrific question on uh, brain drain and how you deal with that. So, okay, great. Well, so, really, whichever order you'd like to yeah, okay. take uh, take those in, uh, Dr. Yeah. Kaikas. Lady should get preference, mm -hmm. so I should answer first that. Okay. Well, uh, to my opinion, in fact, uh, I don't uh, consider brain drain uh, is a big issue uh, because we are globally connected so much. Uh, the brain never drains. Uh, <laughs> it, it comes back. And second is, the brains that we are talking about, let me give you two examples, like, or even Bangladesh, three examples. China has grown tremendously, right? We might have a lot of questions about their democracy and the way they are doing, but they have grown tremendously. So the Chinese people has been uh, coming to this country over two centuries, right? And uh, you know, <clears throat> in every PhD program, you will find at least 20 to 25 percent from China, right? And most of them, many of them are staying back here. Then how come they progressed? And interestingly, these brains are a bit selfish. <laughs> when they find, if, you know, opportunity, they are going back now. Uh, so, um, development does not depend on wholly some uh, brains and, uh, you know, especially those who are in academic institutions, uh, they don't have to be in the country. They are growing actually, so for, so for instance, a scientist who is working in the U.S. can contribute more in the field of science than, say, for instance, staying in Bangladesh because we cannot provide him or her, the best lab. So what is the uh, harm if they do it here? Uh, because it is not that the knowledge that has been generated in the U.S. is kept secret. Uh, the knowledge is uh, available everywhere. So I think uh, this is <clears throat> something. And then civil service, you know, uh, cannot be made attractive with money. You know, civil service, if you want to take this as a profession, you have to have passion and commitment. And the dignity that you receive, that's the most 
uh, foremost attraction. Because you see who is most allured or provoca provoked uh, to uh, receive money in, in return of doing something. That is the civil service. So say for instance, I am a corrupt police official. Okay. Now the government says, no, 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 I am going to give you enough money so that you can. Uh. But there, there is a say murder case of a very wealthy person. So when he comes with million dollars, can the government replace his million dollar offer with, you know, uh, uh, salary? No. So, the, I think the bottom line is that I have to do ethical job with whatever I have. Yes, the government has a responsibility to provide at least my food and shelters, but, you know, to make attractive, you know, you cannot increase packages. So, you know, especially in civil service, you have to be content with what you are doing. And what at the end of the day, what recognition I am doing. I think I, I mentioned this yesterday. I was not at all interested in civil service. Many of my friends were, uh, uh, you know, joining, uh, they uh, joined like multinational companies and good salary. But my <coughs> mother has forced me. And now, at this age, I see that I am a more fulfilled person than my friends, those who worked in, you know, uh, multinational. I'm not saying that they had a miserable life, but fulfilled, you know, completely like, you know, I feel like I have done something, accomplished something in my life. Uh, so this is the difference. Even in the, in the U.S., um, you know, um, the uh, salary of the people, those who are serving in the civil service is much lower than the private service. And interestingly, you know, um, uh, as a board member, um, we are deprived of uh, salary. The reason is that the US ED cannot get more the highest salary than uh, in the civil service of US. So he, he or she has a cap. So then the rest, <laughs> we are stuck to that. <laughs> so, however, uh, but the bank is paying enough uh, to uh, cover my expenses as well as uh, to satisfy some of the unsatisfied needs that I had before. So, you know, so this is what it is. I mean, uh, don't look into the, like, you know, immediate gains, as I think uh, I have been uh, preaching this since yesterday. Coming to your BRICS point, I hope that uh, mm -hmm. is enough, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, coming to BRICS, you see, this is a very uh, geopolitical issue and I'm still working in the bank, so I should not uh, uh, talk much about that. But as a personal view, uh, usually there are always balance of, uh, in the world and uh, you will find that someone thinking in a way, the other one is thinking in a different way. And um, if I say, I think it is almost 2,500 years ago, uh, I forgot the name of an Italian uh, general uh, from where actually uh, this theory of deterrence came. Uh, it said that, you know, if you want to uh, deter your opponent, better increase your capacity. Uh, so they will, and since then we have been doing it. Uh, whether it is the right theory, I don't know. Same thing about the economic power. So there are like, you know, um, I think you are uh, young enough, but uh, we can remember uh, this so-called Cold War. So um, that had both military aspect as well as economic aspect. Now, many countries feel that we are not being treated as we should have, uh, especially like emerging countries. And they aspire to become big countries. Uh, for Bangladesh, 
you know we are a small country with a large population we want to take advantage of everything <laughs> so uh, we are good with you know uh, big powers like the us we are also good with this so um, we want to actually uh, bangladesh's foreign policy in fact is very clear is that we don't have uh, any uh, intention to become i mean friendship with all malice to none so uh, that is we are diligently following and uh, but at the same time we also show that we are willing to align if you don't pay attention to me so that is a kind of like you know diplomatic uh, issue rather than uh, rather than um, you know uh, serious in my opinion and then um, there is i think an you know very substantive issue in this kind of activities is that say china i mean asian countries china india bangladesh if these countries grow and individual buying capacity grows the future market of the world is here so i think the world has to think how they are going to adjust with it in my opinion whether fighting is the ultimate result but as a student of economics i believe rather than you know making the use of these opportunities is a better way to make a better world that's my personal opinion friendship with all and marriage to none okay we, 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 we've, we've got that yeah. okay a couple more questions from the floor let's take a, a couple from the floor and then we'll uh, do on zoom as well please uh, hello hmm. um, thank you for uh, sharing your experience um, um, uh, i'm from uzbekistan my name is Shaksal, and um, what i want to know is um, uh, you have studied the city and um, you have acquired you know it's a very useful knowledge here um, knowledge and experience here. Um, I think the professors are amazing at CD and uh, they teach a lot of useful things here. And um, what I want to know is like, how uh, did you, uh, can you tell us, uh, you know, so your own contribution to policy making when you, when you went back to Bangladesh after graduation, um, how did the know, know, knowledge and experience you gained um, here at CDE, how did you use you know, so this knowledge to, um, to make a difference or to make an impact, to make a change in policy making when you go back home? Great, great, great question. So how, and how did you apply what you wanted when you mm -hmm. back home? We'll take uh, one and two at the same time here, please. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. My name is Solomon. I come from Zimbabwe. Uh, my question is centered around uh, the current issue, the current crisis that uh, most developing countries are encountering. To the extent that some are fully tolerated, some are partially tolerated. Mm -hmm. So, what's your take with regards to tolerization? Mm -hmm. Considering the first that it brings its own pitfalls, it also, it's, I mean, the current is usually their own value. Uh, vis a vis the problem that the local currencies they usually lose value. So, what's your take with regards to dollar Should countries promote it? Or? Okay. Okay, thank you. So, dollarization, and then we have to, uh, one queue from uh, online. Yep. Oh, yes, I'm happy to pass that. A couple from online, I think they're very closely related to uh, Shaksal's question. Uh, so, one question is from uh, 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 our alum from uh, CDD class of 2022 last year, uh, Bilek Basandawa, uh, and he asks, uh, throughout your career as a public servant, what skill set did you find most useful in your career, um, and how have these skill sets changed as you were uh, as you were promoted uh, uh, through the through, through through the positions in the hierarchy? Um, so I think that's somewhat related to, yep, sure. uh, to skill sets that you've picked up at the mm -hmm. CBE and, and, and how you've applied it. Um, another uh, related question, which I think is interesting, 
Um, uh, maybe you can fold that in, into your answer, uh, Dr. Backhouse. Uh, this is from uh, uh, a CDE uh, alum from the class of 2020, uh, Borel uh, Natsafa, who's currently at, uh, at the PhD program at George Washington University. He asks, regarding the relationship with politicians, uh, what are some tips you might share with us uh, that facilitate this relationship? <laughs> Um, uh, should we avoid the overuse of our technical knowledge um, and, uh, and, and should we learn other skills as we're going along? So I think these are all general great, questions great that are related uh, to skill right. sets and application of skill sets and adapting those skill sets uh, both on the job as well as uh, in uh, relationships with uh, in people of influence that we have to work with. So I thought I would package them all together uh, right. and, and uh, provide Dr. Kaikas an opportunity sure. to Right. Sure. Okay. That's probably enough questions for this, yeah, for this yeah. round. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah, so. Now I'm probably getting lost. So I think uh, your question is very much related to these. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. let me answer the dollar first. Mm -hmm. um, you see, I think um, you are teaching monetary economics, right? Here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so you know, um, we call hard currency and soft currency, right? So, nobody actually declares which one is hard currency and which one is soft currency. That depends on the market, right? Uh, uh, like IMF or UN or any other institution has never uh, declared that US dollar is the currency that everyone has to use. US dollar became a hard currency because those who were transacting, uh, they find more convenient. That is how it emerged. Similarly, you know, um, similar to dollar like pound and uh, um, euro, uh, uh, Japan yen has uh, lost its, but these are the, you know, dominant currencies uh, and um, uh, I think we can consider all four, uh, I think in my opinion three. And <clears throat> when the euro emerged, everybody said that this is the demise of uh, dollar regime, uh, but it did not happen. Why is that? The reason, well, I think, I mean, uh, Bernie and uh, Tom, he was in investment banking, so uh, they know much better than me. But uh, in a, uh, I think from my, uh, my perspective, I would say that this does not depend on how much uh, trading is being done by US. Like when I'm trading with, like for instance, China prefers always dollars. Uh, recently, we had some yuan uh, we wanted to trade with them, but they said, okay, no, uh, give us dollar. So, even China being the largest trade deficient, uh, I mean, uh, uh, with the US, uh, the, I think, uh, trade deficit is highest with China, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And China prefers dollar. Why is that? Because they have a target to trade with other countries. So, unless they get the dollar or, you know, so that is why you always make your policies. So, how can you reduce the impact of dollars? Then you have to bring up other institutions that have the confidence in doing in other way. That is the very simple answer because you see um, financial institutions, MasterCard, uh, visa, all these, I mean now digital technology when is there, even because the, it is not only trade, it is also the financial system is made in such a way that dollar has the dominance. So nobody came up with like for instance, what is the alternative of a visa and MasterCard? There are some American Express, discover all these, you know, even Apple nowadays, these are all US companies. So, 
if you want to do business with me, I would pay for dollar. Now, unfortunately or fortunately, we have not been able to build up another system that can have the transactionary value. For that, in, in fact, I don't see at this moment taking some steps is not going to solve anything. Let me tell you one story. We got a sanction in uh, Bangladesh from US. Uh, so um, our reserve is in, uh, you know, um, dollar, almost all the uh, money. So we thought that, you know, we should diversify. So we bought some, uh, you know, um, pound, euro, uh, others. Do you know how much money we lost in this idiotic step? <laughs> Almost $250 million. Because all of a sudden, you know, uh, dollar value has increased and euro went down. So with that, so I think, you know, making this type of, uh, you know, steps is, yes, we might have an alternative uh, currency because, uh, you know, um, US uh, maybe is becoming too powerful, maybe. But unless you come up with, you know, associated institutions, activities, I don't think that uh, dollar is going to be uh, replaced by any currency very soon. So we, as a practitioner, we need to admit this and then you know, uh, we should try to uh, resolve if any problem we have, okay. Now, about CD, your question was, was, what is, what was? Yes, um, yes. Uh, how did you uh, extrapolate? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. And also what sort of skill sets did you yeah. find most useful sure. coming out of CDC and how uh -huh. that uh, evolved over time uh, as well, yeah. Um, I think one uh, significant, uh, you know, um, tool I have always tried to use uh, since I left CD is that, you know, um, what would be the economic and social impact and what are the reasons uh, I try to see that. Let me uh, then give you a practical example. Uh, since I was uh, literally uh, stood just beside the Prime Minister during the pandemic. So, you know, um, when we sat with the Prime Minister, what are the, you know, uh, now the first step in the pandemic was to stall everything, right? Lockdown. Then, um, I think you are also young practitioners. So the country is going to be locked down. So that means no uh, uh, connectivity with the rest of the world. And even at your home, uh, you are not allowed to go anywhere, right? How do you think, uh, uh, I mean, what would be the steps taken by the government at this time? Just give me uh, your thought instantly. You don't have to be perfect. So um, basically, um, if there's no trade among countries and then if there's a lockdown and nobody, nobody goes to work, nobody earns uh, income, and in that situation, everybody's like locked at home. Mm -hmm. So uh, the government starts, uh, that's what happened in my country as well. Uh, at that time I was working at the Ministry of Economic Development as well. That's what we had to deal with as well. Um, and the uh, government started um, um, distributing a certain amount of money, mm -hmm. uh, especially to, um, to uh, you know, to very underprivileged, you know, some layer of the population. So that's what happened. And then the uh, government had to um, support businesses as well. And um, um, so, um, 
and then cut taxes, and nobody nobody paid ta taxes at that time, and then you know um, that's what happened. You know, so they were like fiscal measures, and then you know um, um, and monetary. It is a policy measures like you know uh, encourage government had to um, cut interest rates and businesses uh, uh, businesses borrowed a lot of money credit from the government and then um, obviously they had to default on their on their loan and therefore the government had to especially you know so the government of Uzbekistan. Yeah, had problem with that because a lot of businesses borrowed money from the government and they couldn't pay, and the interest, interest because of high interest rates, and then you know so no business activity, so um, everything got frozen and then you know so basically government had to help businesses um, by letting them not pay interest rate for for a certain amount of time. That's what happened. Okay, so. Wow, you are a CDA fellow. <laughs> In fact, that is what we, I mean, how we, uh, since I was the principal secretary, so I had to steer this. This is exactly, you know, uh, I, we tried to, I mean, um, uh, formulate policies, what to do. Number one is health crisis, how to deal with this. There, there is an economic impact, there is also administrative uh, issues. How to incentivize doctors because all the doctors went home. I mean, the even general people went uh, before they went to home. Our doctors went to home uh, because they apprehended more danger than others. So we have to bring them back. We had these law enforcing agencies required to enforce uh, the lockdown. So one was the lockdown then uh, providing, uh, you know, um, um, health services and then what would be the economic impact. So, what, I mean, as a, you know, uh, CD alumni or a, a student of economics or a political economy, you'd rather say, then I thought what are the principal issues that is going to be the, uh, you know, um, uh, needed for government's help. I mean, people don't need government's help all the time. Then, as you said, we have, you know, um, divided the segments of the population, right? And then we have also identified the businesses, those who are going to be immediately impacted. And third is how to um, keep the supply channel open. So we never went, I mean, uh, in Bangladesh, the Prime Minister gave, up, uh, gave a very good uh, line of uh, uh, action, it's called lives and livelihood. Saving lives and livelihood is our policy. So we never went for a 100% lockdown for more than two months, not even in one stretch. And even the 100% lockdowns, we have opened up our supply lines, supply channel. So all our you know, uh, uh, yeah, materials movement was open. Our port was also open. Uh, we never uh, stopped this. Then businesses, we never reduce the interest rate for them. Rather, we have identified what are the pressing need for them. So our garments manufacturer told us that, you know, we cannot pay the salary of the uh, uh, workers. Then we said, we are going to pay you salary. So you, we are going to give you uh, the um, uh, salary with two four percent interest, and uh, the payment actually uh, we uh, uh, delayed it for six months. So we made, as I mentioned yesterday, twenty nine economic packages. 
over around almost around 8 billion dollars. That has actually impacted and then we never gave free money other than 35, 3.5 million uh, you know people got money in Taka terms around like you know uh, 25, uh, sorry uh, 250 dollars. That was the only amount we gave. Otherwise, we provided, you know, um, uh, um, uh, food supplies. Why we did that? The reason is, if we give money, the consequence would be high inflation, which we never wanted. And that is why our inflation rate was very low during uh, COVID. Like, for instance, in the U.S., they distributed money uh, uh, right away. So we never thought that this is a good idea. Uh, so um, and as you know, U.S.'s inflation is different from uh, countries like Bangladesh and any others because our inflation does not completely depend on our, our currency. Whereas U.S. currency uh, has the power of uh, uh, making inflation. So everything you know, I think, I mean, uh, the coordination uh, in policy perspective was, uh, since people say that that was very successful, uh, I think my training in CD and uh, uh, I have to, uh, I mean, uh, maybe uh, I'm amplifying myself, but it was true that I was at the helm of the affairs. So I think my uh, training and my PhD program here uh, at uh, Will, uh, you know, uh, Texas has paid me back to understand the context as well as to face the economic challenges. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. hope uh, that satisfied your answer. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were other questions which was... Uh, there aren't any else. I, I, would, I would maybe, I think it answers a couple of other questions that were already there. Mm -hmm. I would maybe uh, circle back and just, uh, uh, this one point that had come up was uh, uh, in, in conversations with politicians. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That, that, you know, should we avoid uh, overuse of technical knowledge? Uh, or should we, or is there other skills that we should have? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you see, this is, um, you know, um, this might be very, uh, uh, I don't know whether it is going to be appropriate example, is how you are behave, going to behave with your wife, nobody can define. <laughs> you have to find your own way, right? So the same exact formula probably applies how you are going to deal with your boss. Uh, okay. You know, um, in my case, if I may, uh, that I try to make friendship and at times quite tough. Like for instance, um, there was a meeting uh, with the minister, they were showing me uh, some proposal uh, about uh, uh, anticipated activities. So, um, he was um, in favor of that and I, uh, I started my, so he was asking my comment and I told him that uh, I'm sure you are not going to like it, but uh, I don't think this is a good idea. Then he commented with a, you know, sarcastic uh, mode that you see the government officials never understand this. Uh, so then I reacted in a, in a way that you know had I not been in uh, the government you would have listened to me with money uh, because I have more credentials than these guys. Uh, so you have to be sometimes uh, or bounce back you have tough. to bounce back, mm -hmm. tough. Otherwise, you know, uh, they will never listen. And one day, uh, we were saying that, you know, um, some 
activities that you know uh, I should be very careful. So I told him very flatly that if you want to intimidate me, uh, you have the right to remove me from here, but I am not intimidated at all. So these are the like you know uh, so-called <laughs> tough words that I have used, but at the same time the next uh, hour I try to be very uh, you know friendly with him so uh, to forget the you know the bitter experiences. That is how you manage here. Uh, so, uh, but uh, uh, my confidence in a sense that I have as I said I have worked uh, you know um, he understands like you know power sector uh, has a full potential of uh, this is a business venture. So, uh, to be uh, you know polluted, but without being polluted uh, you can still work with your reputation. That is what I think uh, uh, at the end of my career I can say very confidently now. So, that is possible, that is what I, I would like to say, but I mean every day what you are going to do you have to find your own way. Well, that is a great note to uh, conclude on. Uh, we started with uh, advice for policymakers, and we've wound up with uh, advice for relationships. So uh, we've covered uh, really quite, quite, quite a lot here for uh, all of you uh, as you uh, prepare for the rest of your time at CDE and your time after CDE. And there were so many great pieces of uh, advice uh, uh, for uh, your futures in the uh, conversations here with Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Kaikas, and uh, it's hard to pick out a few, uh, but I just offer from, from things that I heard, um, uh, keeping the value of relating to uh, different people, uh, people from different backgrounds that you uh, can pick up here at CDE. Uh, remembering uh, how uh, important uh, your own views are and your own experiences are yeah, and not uh, to be I'm sorry, can I, can I yeah, interrupt of course. for a second? I think that uh, piece mm -hmm. I have completely missed. Yes, you know the first time I have friendship with uh, friends from Africa was in mm -hmm. CDE. So this diverse, uh, you know, I have mm -hmm. never met such a diverse, uh, you know, uh, uh, student group mm -hmm. before and that gave us, I mean all of you, you are going to have this experience mm -hmm. of the whole world. Mm -hmm. uh, I have never met an, uh, any, any person from uh, African continent, mm -hmm. but uh, we, I was so fortunate to have, uh, even I have mm -hmm. a friendship with them uh, mm -hmm. up until now. So this is a very good one, I think I missed it. So you see there, there is a future after CDE. Uh, just don't forget to break for kids in the crosswalk. And uh, <laughs> join me in thanking Dr. Kaikos for uh, having been with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.